Hello, welcome to the Saroy channel. I'm so very glad you've joined me this evening. I've got such a lovely story for you where we get a bit of divine justice against a uh, rape that is taking place because Bigfoot steps on the scene to save the day. And it's a story I just love and I know you're going to love it too. And so let's get started. But before we do, make sure you subscribe to the channel because I've got so many more wonderful stories for you to listen to and you don't want to miss out. So let's get started. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, my name is Marilyn and my story happened in the late 1980s when I was doing a four-year undergraduate major at a liberal arts college. Now I will not be giving you names or places for obvious reasons, but I will tell you this, it was somewhere in North America. One day it was all over the college that there was a young student who had been raped and murdered and found at the edge of the wooded area on the college grounds. The students liked to use this route by way of a shortcut to access a shopping area on the other side of the woods. It was a real bummer and we were advised that when we accessed this area, we should never be on our own. I remember the police interviewing everybody on campus. Had we seen or heard anything? Did we know anything or anyone who was dating the girl in question and so forth. The questions went on and on. After a while, the case di died down until suddenly the rapist was in business again. There were five more girls murdered and raped. And whoever the perpetrator was, he was getting bold and very sure of himself in his actions. He had killed and raped one girl in the female toilets, another one in a back alley in the campus, and the other three were on the campus grounds in close proximity to the pool where he had flung their bodies after he had killed them. The rapist did seem to have a type that he pursued. As all the girls he raped were blonde, they were slim and fair. Everyone at college was absolutely terrified. All the women were looking over their shoulders, wondering if the rapist was in their midst. I remember the blonde girls all dyeing their hair in the hope of turning their would-be pursuer in another direction. The girls tended to stick together and there was a very real fear of even accepting a date from a boy. So times were tough for us and we had to stick together and we did, until the police found the perpetrator to this terrible crime. For the first time in my life, I was grateful to be a plain Jane and not eye candy for the boys to feast on. For once in my life, I was glad I did not look like an aspiring model and I did feel confident that the rapist would not be pursuing me. A police profiler came to the college to talk to the students. He said that they had drawn up what they believed was an accurate profile of the rapist. They described him as a loner who enjoyed outdoor pursuits, especially hunting. He had probably been abusive towards animals all his life and possibly killed them in sadistic ways for sheer pleasure. He would have an intense hatred for women. This, the profile believed, stemmed from a, a mother who he believed was a slim woman with blonde hair who may have been a model in her youth and for some reason he hated her. He went on to say that the rapist felt very inadequate as far as women were concerned and had never had a girlfriend, but she believed he had visited ladies of the night regularly and was a rarely, rarely a sadomasochist. The profiler believed that this guy was thin and scrawny and not very good looking or attractive. He had been cut off from his home by his mother and was supporting himself with manual jobs. He was antisocial, evasive and emotionally immature. Nobody had any clue who this bloke was, but there was a marked increase in the dating game again, although the girls would only go for good looking muscular types who did not fit the profile. I knew one girl very well who I believed was the perfect type for the rapist. I will call her Sue so as to keep her details confidential. Anyway, unlike the other blonde girls who fit the rapist's credentials, Sue flaunted her blonde hair and her slim body as if she was waiting to become the next Playboy bunny. I seriously worried about her because she was a nice girl really, but her naivety was off the charts. While other girls were covering up their assets, Sue was showing them off and making sure that every boy in college had the hots for her. She tottered around like a dolly bird with short skirts, low cut blouses and tons of makeup done to perfection. One day I was staring outside the college window just quite by accident and I suddenly noticed Sue taking a shortcut through the wooded area that we were strictly told not to go through without another person with us. 
It was out of bounds for anybody who was walking on their own. I imagine she was going to meet a boy, but on this day she was dressed like a real floozy, if ever I saw one. As I watched her tottering into the woods, I caught a glimpse of a thin man following her, and my heart sank. I had visions of Sue being another rape victim or statistic. I was certain that this guy, whoever he was, potentially could be the rapist the police were looking for. Hastily, I ran down the stairs as fast as I could, out of the campus grounds, in, into the wooded area, and sure enough, I could hear screaming. And it was poor Sue, and she was begging and begging for her life. I stood behind the tree, watching the scene unfold, and I realised suddenly how defensive I was, defenceless I was. The rapist could also take me down and even kill me if I intervened. I saw him pulling down Sue's skirts and she was struggling and kicking her legs violently, but she was no match for the skinny guy who clearly was incredibly strong. Suddenly I heard the loudest guttural growl I have ever heard and it was the most terrifying sound. And it was so startling that even the ro rapist loosened his hold on Sue for a moment in his horror. And Sue didn't waste any time. She took this opportunity to flee from the scene and run back to the college as fast as she could. Then I saw him. I have never in all my born days seen a creature as imposing and as terrifying. I could feel my own fear observing this monstrous creature that looked like he had come from an age when monsters roamed the earth. The thing, whatever it was, stood on two humongous legs with a stature of ten feet tall and possibly eight feet across. He was gargantuan and his body was covered with thick black hair. He had long arms and human-like hands and feet and his face looked like that of a great magnificent ape. He had a humanness about him, but he was not human and an ape-like quality to him, but he was not an ape. I could see the creature's brown eyes were furious and the rage he expressed was palpable. I have no idea if he had seen the attempted rape of Sue with his own eyes, but I imagined he may have. Could this be the cause of his fury or was he just being territorial? I was not sure, but never have I witnessed such anger in my whole life. This creature flung the rapist in the air, catching him before he fell so as to prolong the agony. The guy was screaming, help, help, but the creature continued to fling him up in the air, terrorizing the man again and again and again. And after he'd had his fun, he then literally pulled off one of the man's legs and threw it across the florist floor. And then he tore up an arm and did exactly the same. The rapist was still alive in those moments and the look on his face was one of complete and utter terror. And when he saw his leg lying near to him, he screamed. Suddenly the life ebbed away from him and he lay there limp and I knew that he was dead. Even though his life was ceased, the creature kept slamming the body of the man against the tree until it rarely became just a pile of blood, fat and goo. And even the head was crushed into the ground like a large ostrich egg. The creature's anger subsided. And just when the police came running in the woods to apprehend the culprit, they were stunned by the pile of goo that awaited them on the forest floor. By then, the creature had long since exited the scene as quickly as he had come. I took this opportunity to slip away. There was absolutely no need to talk to the police and I doubt they would have ever believed my story about the strange creature that I saw, which I now know to be the hairy man, Bigfoot or Sasquatch. I knew justice had been done to that nasty ra rapist and Sue was free to dress as inappropriately as she liked. So all was well for the college again. I never even told Sue that the Bigfoot actually saved her life. She never even knew about the Bigfoot. What would have been the point anyway? Sue did change after her experience. She dyed her hair black and dressed in modest clothes 
and through the rest of college, I never saw her flirt with anyone, not once. As for the guy who tried to rape Sue, and thankfully never succeeded, the criminal profile's assessment of this chap was spot on in every single way. It was utterly extraordinary how accurate it was. One day, I did get a picture of the rapist's mother in the paper, and I kid you not, she looked exactly like the woman he had raped. All those women he had raped looked just like his mother. My theory is that he hated his mother so very much, and the only way to get back at her and to extract revenge was by attacking women that looked exactly like her, and that is clearly what he did. I hope you found my story of interest. It is the first time I've ever shared it. Shared it. Thank you so much for that amazing story, and I'm so glad justice was done, because nobody deserves to be raped. Until next time, good night and goodbye.